Steve McQueen. He was as big as it gets in Hollywood. He was a rebel, a high-flying, fast-driving, gunslinging movie star whose career brought him levels of fame and fortune that are hard to imagine. Marshall Terrell wrote a biography about him. There was women, there was cars, there was all these things that he felt were uh, the measure of success. There was this quest for stardom. He wanted the money, he wanted the fame, he wanted the perks, and uh, that's what he lived for. We talked with Marshall Terrell about Steve McQueen's unlikely journeys to stardom and to faith in Jesus Christ. Marshall's our guest on this episode of GPS, God, People, Stories. It's an outreach of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I'm Phil Fleischman. And I'm Ethan Jones. I'm sitting in for Jim Kirkland this week. Yeah, hey, Ethan. It's nice to have you here. Thanks, Phil. It's good to be here. The Steve McQueen was the Brad Pitt of his day. The Chris Pratt of the 60s and 70s. His net worth when he died in 1980 was $30 million. That's equivalent to $542 million in 2020. To this day, he remains one of the wealthiest actors of all time. Steve McQueen was also considered one of the coolest actors of his time by a lot of people. To put it into perspective, in the 60s, Frank Sinatra invited Steve to join his tight circle of famous friends known as the Rat Pack, Steve said no. In spite of all of that, Steve McQueen spent most of his life searching for something he could never seem to find. A little later in the episode, you're going to hear Billy Graham say something about searching. You can have success. You might reach the top. But there's a loneliness. There's an emptiness. You can be rich. But if you're without God, you have nothing. If you've experienced that emptiness and you'd like to know more about finding the fulfillment that comes only through a relationship with God, we can help. Visit us online at findpeacewithgod.net or you can call our 24-hour prayer line. The number is 888-388-2683. Both the number and the website are in the show notes. GPS. God. People. Stories. Steve McQueen grew up during the Great Depression, and Marshall Terrell says his life was marked by instability and struggle. Steve McQueen was born in a Beach Grove, uh, Indiana, which is just a suburb of Indianapolis, um, on March 24th, 1930. His parents were both alcoholics, and his father left when he was six months old. The mother was pretty much like a wild teenager, and so her parents had to raise Steve. Shortly after Steve turned four, his grandparents faced a number of problems because of the Great Depression, not the least of which was homelessness. They felt they had no choice but to send Steve to live with his Uncle Claude. Uncle Claude was an interesting fellow. He was a hardworking farmer who was married to a younger woman, um, but was known to to cheat and uh, sleep around. But he had this hard work ethic, uh, and, and, you know, Steve learned more from him than anyone else. But, uh, you know, he, he also saw the cheating. To make things even more complicated, Steve's mother would sporadically come in and out of his life, oftentimes with a new husband in the picture, most of whom were abusive. Steve struggled to cope with the abuse of his stepfathers, the infidelity of his uncle Claude, and the inconsistency of his living arrangements. On top of all of that, he was diagnosed with dyslexia and hearing problems. It wasn't long, says Marshall, before Steve found himself getting into trouble. By the age of 10 or 11, he was a, pretty much a full-on juvenile delinquent. And, um, you know, he was, he was getting into trouble. He talked a lot about sleeping on the streets, um, you know, learning street life, um, breaking into shops, getting into all sorts of mischief, stealing hubcaps, um, skipping school. Um, so, yeah, he was, uh, he was headed for jail. But then there was a glimmer of hope. Shortly after he turned 14, his mom enrolled Steve in a reform school in Chino, California. When Steve McQueen entered the Boys Republic uh, in February of 1946, he was 14 years old. And um, there, for the very first time, he was introduced to some discipline in his life. He was introduced uh, to some mentors who took a special interest in him. And so um, there was a gentleman there by the name of Frank Graves, who was the head of Boys Republic, 
who told Steve, you know, if you really gave yourself a fair shot in life, you could go very far. And that was the very first time that Steve McQueen was given some sort of positive reinforcement. Finally, Steve had found a place where he could thrive. Unfortunately, it wouldn't last long. Just as Steve was getting settled into his new life at the Boys' Republic, his mother pulled him out of school and moved him to New York City to live with her. Faced once more with a difficult home life and feeling like he was on his own, Steve fell back into his old ways. Marshall says one day, Steve met two men at a bar who convinced him to leave New York and join the Merchant Marines. They made it sound like a great adventure. Well, he gets on there, and the first thing he's he's given is a mop. And so uh, he's mopping this... Uh, deck all the way to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Realizing that the Merchant Marines wasn't the great adventure it was made out to be, Steve decided to abandon ship in Puerto Rico and soon found himself in, let's just say, a less than savory place. A brothel. At 16, Steve McQueen worked as a towel boy in a Puerto Rican brothel for several months before deciding to make his way back to New York City, where, believe it or not, he found himself in even more trouble. And he gets, uh, he gets arrested for vagrancy, and then he's put on a chain gang. And he kind of wakes up in, he, in New York City and says, what am I doing with my life? Where am I going to be when I'm 50? So he decided that at the age of 17 that he was going to join the Marines because they were going to, quote, unquote, make a man out of me. And so he was 17. He needed his mother's permission, um, and he got it. And so um, he joined the Marines. Searching for the same kind of stability and discipline he had thrived under at the Boys' Republic, Steve set out to become a Marine. But Marshall says he couldn't quite shake his bad behavior. He was thrown in the brig for 41 days at one point in time. And it it was because um, he went AWOL, but then on top of that, uh, he got in a fight with a police officer. Um, Back then, police officers were given notices of of soldiers uh, who were stragglers. And so... um, He caught McQueen, and then they got into a tussle. And so part of his punishment uh, for going AWOL at that point in time was that uh, he would have to pull out the pipes in the hull of the ship. Make a mental note of that. Steve's punishment of pulling pipes out of the hull of the ship would have dire ramifications in his life years down the road. We'll get to that a little later. After spending three years in the U.S. Marine Corps, Steve was honorably discharged and given a payment to help him restart his life as a civilian. That payment totaled $47. So that's probably all he had in his pocket. Um, And then he made his way to Washington, D.C., where he uh, was a taxi driver and mechanic. And he was there for six weeks, and he said nothing was happening there. So I thought I'd make my way back to the Big Apple. So he, he finds himself back in New York City, where all the action is. Back in the action of New York City, Steve starts dating a young woman who gives him an idea that would set him on a new trajectory. And she says, you know, you're so kooky and you've had these incredible life experiences that you would really become, you would be a great actor. Intrigued by the thought, Steve decided to reach out to his mom's boyfriend for help. So his, his mother's boyfriend uh, wrote a letter on behalf of McQueen to the neighborhood playhouse, which uh, was uh, headed up by a, a gentleman by the name of Sanford Meisner. And Sanford Meisner was really kind of Steve McQueen's first acting mentor and the one that he gives the most credit to. And, um, you know, McQueen was very, very raw. So he saw raw talent when, you know, when when it was in his face. And and McQueen, he felt, was going to be the next big talent. Steve's unique life experiences may have made him a raw talent. But Marshall says growing up and learning to survive those unique experiences made it difficult for Steve to express himself on stage. He was a person that, um, you know, just uh, had suffered through so much pain and anguish. Um, And he was a shy, inward person. And um, acting, you know, he said, was like um, swallowing a lot of broken glass. And that it was just, you you know, you had to to turn your guts inside out. And acting was hard for him because um, he was a guy that didn't really show his emotions. Before he found his way to a movie set, Steve tried his hand on Broadway. But because he struggled to express himself emotionally, it wasn't quite the success he was hoping for. Realizing that Broadway wasn't going to work out for him, he started looking for opportunities in film. He would eventually land a role in the movie The Blob. It was a film about a gelatinous alien creature that consumes everything it touches. Oddly enough, The Blob was produced by a Christian production company called Good News Productions. And it was here that Steve would have his first exposure to authentic Christianity. 
the filmmakers, the, the graphic designers, the script people, uh, wardrobe, everybody was a Christian. And so uh, before, before they shot every day, they prayed. So Steve, you know, saw for the first time, again, how Christians acted, how they lived, how they prayed, how they worked together. But nothing about the cast and crew's Christianity seemed to have much of an impact on Steve or his behavior. And the film's producer, Russell Dotton, was concerned about him. He saw where Steve was kind of a profane guy. Um, you know, he witnessed Steve get tossed in jail a few times for speeding. Um, he, you know, he, he just knew that Steve was a bit of a wild child. And so, you know, pulled him aside, had a talk with him, gave him a Bible because he felt like he was getting ready to go to Hollywood and that he was going to enter his wilderness years. And uh, he, um, he dog-eared a uh, verse for him, which was John 3.16. Although a seed had been planted in Steve's life, he wasn't ready to focus on anything except his quest for stardom. Steve continued with roles in a few smaller films until he met an up-and-coming Broadway actress by the name of Neil Adams. In 1956, the now B-list actor drove his motorcycle to pick up Neil for their first date. Marshall says Steve and Neil married later that year, packed their bags, and moved to Hollywood. She was actually the more successful one of the two. She was a, she was a dancer, but she was doing a movie called This Could Be the Night, and everybody was elbowing him and pushing him out of the way and calling him uh, Mr. Adams, and he did not like that at all. That's when Steve McQueen realized he had to become a star. So he had his wife, Neil, make a call to her manager, Hilly Elkins. So Hilly got him a, a, a job, um, a pilot called Trackdown. Um, and Steve McQueen was, had a guest role. And McQueen was so, um, so electrifying in this role that the, the network executive said, we got to give this guy his own show. And that show turned out to be One of Dead or Alive, which was the TV show that made him a household name. Steve would star in Wanted Dead or Alive from 1958 to 1960. But that wasn't enough. Steve had no interest in settling for the fame and success that came along with TV acting in the early 60s. Steve McQueen was a very hungry guy. Um, tele- being a television star just wasn't going to do it for him. He wanted to become a movie star. And he didn't want to just become a movie star. He wanted to be the biggest movie star in Hollywood. And he didn't care... Uh, how many bodies he had to climb over. I mean, he was, there was a ruthlessness to him uh, in his quest for stardom. If it meant stealing a scene from a co-star, he would do it. And he was the, actually the very first TV star to actually transition to movies. But he had not found that vehicle just yet. And that vehicle uh, turned out to be The Great Escape in 1963, which you know, vaunted him to superstardom. Steve McQueen had arrived. The Great Escape had made him a cultural icon who was second to none, and his career was showing no signs of slowing down. Marshall says in 1974, Steve McQueen became the highest paid actor in the world, earning $14 million. This was a guy that, that literally had everything. Um, and he would, you know, he, he was the envy of everybody. I mean, he, that's, that's part of the charm of Steve McQueen was that, like, he was this... Uh, he was this rebel, um, and, but he had it all. And that's kind of like the, that's the American dream. But even though his career was soaring, his home life was struggling. He wanted the wife. He wanted the, the kids. He wanted the tight family unit. But there was this private side of him that uh, he'd sneak off, you know, to, uh, to the Sunset Strip, which was just five miles down from his house. Um, and so he would have this private life where... Um, he knew the owner of the Whiskey Go-Go who would set him up with a lot of different women. You know, during the late 60s, it was the age of Aquarius. It was free love. It was drugs. And he started heading in that direction. And that's what really caused problems in their marriage. Steve's self-destructive lifestyle eventually led to his divorce from Neil Adams in 1972. And that coincided with the filming of The Getaway where he fell in love with his co-star, Ally McGraw. And they were married um, for a period of five years. They got married in 1973 and were divorced in 78. And so uh, every time that he had his perfect marriage and this perfect family life thing going on, he would, he would go off and you know, almost sabotage himself um, with uh, this private life. Steve's fast-paced life would continue until he met Barbara Minty. She was a young and successful model. 
the two fell in love and moved in together in 1979. But Marshall says as Steve and Barbara's relationship grew stronger, Steve realized that all of the money and fame he had been pursuing weren't fulfilling him. Steve McQueen was searching um, for peace his entire life. And, and, you know, that search took him to a lot of interesting and strange and dark places. Ultimately, he thought that fame was going to bring him whatever happiness that he was searching for. And, you know, he was a guy that was just never happy, never satisfied, never content, always wanting more. And then dissatisfied when he got to the mountaintop, um, he was the highest paid movie star in, in all the world. Um, and then all of a sudden, he decides that he's just going to quit the movie industry for a while because he was just tired. So he grew a beard and a mustache. And back then, that, that, could, that, could, that could hide you, that you could go incognito that way. Steve and Barbara decided to move from Malibu to Santa Paula, a small town about an hour outside of Los Angeles. It's where Steve would start a new, more laid-back hobby, flying antique airplanes. Upon moving to Santa Paula, Steve immediately began looking for a pilot to train him. Marshall says he found a man named Sammy Mason. He was a World War II veteran and a test pilot. When he started taking lessons from Sammy, he, he was just in awe of Sammy. And Sammy was about 10 or 15 years older than Steve. And um, so finally one day, Steve says... There's something different about you. And I can't quite put my finger on it. And Sammy said, well, Steve, it's because I'm, a, because I'm a boarding and Christian. Steve saw in Sammy something that he had been searching for and soon started attending church with him at Ventura Missionary Church. After a few months of attending the church, Steve invited the pastor, Leonard DeWitt, out to lunch. And Steve had, quote, grilled him on the Christian walk for two hours, peppered him with questions. and. Um, so when they were finished, Leonard uh, said, oh, so, so when they were finished, Steve said, okay, all right. And he smiled. And he says, okay, I'm satisfied. And Leonard said, ah, but I have one question for you, Steve. He said, so he said, Steve said, you want to know if I'm a born again Christian or not, don't you? He said, yes, that's all that really matters. He said, well, do you remember when you invited people uh, to close their eyes and say a prayer and invite Jesus into your life? And the pastor said, yes. He goes, well, I closed my eyes and I invited Christ into my life. And he said, yes, I'm a born again Christian. Steve had finally found hope and peace in his life through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Soon after, Steve and Barbara decided to get married. Sadly, though, just about a month before their wedding, Steve and Barbara would receive devastating news. Remember when Steve was punished for going AWOL while he was in the Marines and he was required to pull pipes out of the hull of a ship? Well, those pipes were lined with asbestos. And uh, asbestos, uh, if you didn't know, takes 20 or 30 years to develop. So that happened in December of 1949. He was diagnosed with mesothelioma, a form of asbestos cancer, in December of 1979. So almost 30 years to the day. Despite his diagnosis, Steve and Barbara decided to go ahead with their wedding. They were, they were married in a private ceremony, um, and Sammy Mason and his wife Wanda were, um, were the witnesses. And so he was married by the associate pastor there at the church, a gentleman by the name of Leslie Miller at, at Ventura uh, Baptist Church in Steve's house. So it was a private ceremony, um, and he was surrounded you know, by, by the people that he loved and respected. Steve and Barbara were happily married, and he finally had a sense of fulfillment in his life. But Steve's prognosis was grim. And it wasn't long before his health began to deteriorate. Large tumors had started to grow in his neck and stomach. And doctors believed that they were pressing against his vital organs. Steve couldn't find a doctor in the U.S. who would perform a particular procedure. So he went to Juarez, Mexico, in search of medical treatment. Before he did, though, he asked to meet with someone. Billy Graham. The queen wanted to know what it was going to be like, what the afterlife was going to be like. And he felt like Billy Graham was going to give him those answers. So they were getting ready to pray, and Steve says, well, I don't have my Bible with me. And Billy had his Bible, and he said, well, let me just give you mine. And so he just immediately, just without even thinking about it, handed him over his 96-page New Testament Bible. And in this Bible, there's all sorts of really interesting handwritten notes, and he underlined certain verses. With his faith deeper than ever, Steve boarded a plane and flew to Mexico for his surgery. The surgery was unsuccessful, and Steve McQueen passed away on November 7th, 1980. 
However, Marshall says before he died, there was an irrefutable change in Steve's life that everyone around him couldn't help but notice. And people said he was just happier. I'd asked a lot of people that knew him throughout his life what, what that period was like. And they said that was the happiest period of his life. He was, he was content. He had the wife. They said that uh, one of his buddies said that when uh, each morning he'd throw open the doors and say, welcome to another day in paradise. Steve McQueen spent his life searching for something that would bring him true joy, and he finally found it in a relationship with Jesus Christ. What about you? Is that something you're searching for? If so, we'd love for you to go to our website, findpeacewithgod.net. You can learn about who Jesus is, and you can even chat with one of our 24-7 volunteers there. Again, the address is findpeacewithgod.net. Steve McQueen's final days were filled with faith and determination. You're going to hear more about that from Marshall Terrell in just a minute. You're listening to GPS, God, People, Stories, a podcast production of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. You can have success. You might reach the top. But there's a loneliness, there's an emptiness. Billy Graham, an actor, wrote in a national magazine last week, And he said, I've had all of the money that a man could make. But he said, when I get home, he said, I reach zero, take the mask off. And he said, I'm the loneliest guy in the world. You can be rich, but if you're without God, you have nothing. And you try to show off and try to show that you're a man in this way or that way by doing eccentric things to try to gain your place in the spotlight. But if you put money and pleasure and power first, you're going to come up empty. Now you have a disease. It's going to kill every one of you. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, the Bible says you're infected with this disease. The wages of sin is death. There is only one cure, one medicine that'll work. It's worked in every generation for tens of thousands of people that have put their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ. It'll work in your case tonight if you'll trust him. Billy Graham shared that message during his crusade in Birmingham, Alabama in 1972. And you can hear the rest of the message by visiting the Billy Graham Audio Archives. To do that, just go to billygrahamradio.org and click on Billy Graham Audio Archives. Then search for the title, which is Problems of Youth. Or just use the link we provide in the show notes. Our guest on this episode of GPS is Marshall Terrell. He's written a biography about Steve McQueen. Marshall says after Steve gave his life to Jesus, he knew he had a new and meaningful purpose. Marshall tells the story about one of Steve's last conversations with his pastor, Leonard DeWitt. He was, um, he was going to church all the way up until his diagnosis and, um, and still going to church even after his diagnosis. But Leonard DeWitt told me that, uh, you know, he got that, phone call from Steve saying that I've been diagnosed with this and I'm going to fight it. Um, and that whatever happens, uh, I I know that I'm in the Lord's will. I believe that I have something to give to the world as far as my relationship with the Lord, something I can teach to other people, something about a message I can give. We want to thank Marshall Terrell for sharing the story of Steve McQueen's life and his journey to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Marshall's book is titled Steve McQueen in his own words. We have a link to it in the show notes. Thank you for listening. I'm Ethan Jones. And I'm Phil Fleischman. We also want to thank Mercy Me for the use of some of their music in this episode of GPS, God, People, Stories. It's an outreach of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Always good news. Good news.